Charo, I know you're up next with the bare metal, um, which always sounds to me like a heavy metal band kind of deployment. Um, and I saw the guitars behind you, so uh, it might be appropriate. If we pause uh, now and let the AWS Live thing go um, and let Charo queue up um, for his um, deployment and share his screen. So All thanks. Right very much there, uh, Christian, for uh, hanging out with us, and I hope you can spend some more time today, because I'm sure we'll be repeating some of these questions. Yeah, sure. I'll be here. I'll be here. Cool. Thanks. All right. Do you see a whole bunch of open terminal windows? I do, and I see yes. your sm smiling face, and I'm going to turn my smiling face off. Why don't you introduce yourself and what you're going to demo now? Okay. Uh, I'm Charu Groover. Uh, I am a new uh, architect for uh, Red Hat Services uh, here in the Southeast United States. You have States. reached the Horizon Audio Conferencing System. At any uh -oh. town, enter your conference Sorry. security code followed by the town sign. Let me find out who that is. Pause for a second, everyone, and we'll figure out who is doing something odd here with sound. So I guess uh, Nerlip. Nerlip. Yes. Yeah, it's Nerlip here. I'm looking for him, and I'm just muting him. There you go. All right. So start that again. All right. Carrying on. <laughs> well, like, like Diane has said a couple of times, these are live demos, so um, we're fully expecting a a, a Bill Gates moment. Um, it might not be a blue screen, but we might see a stack trace of death. Uh, and all kinds of other interruptions. But I'm Charo Groover. Uh, I, like I said, I, I've been with Red Hat for, for one week, um, but I've been a consumer of Red Hat products, both upstream and um, subscription-based uh, for most of my 20-year uh, career in IT. So this is kind of the, the dream job that I never knew I always wanted. Uh, and today what I'm going to demonstrate for you guys is a deployment of a bare metal uh, Kubernetes cluster using OKD. Um, this is going to be simulated bare metal in that I'm actually using libvirt to, to run the machines uh, so that, one, so that you guys can actually see what's going on, right? Because it, it'd be hard to get your console views to bare metal machines. Uh, in in this current configuration. Um, this is a user provision infrastructure deployment, so the installer is not going to be provisioning the machines for us. These machines are already provisioned. If you see in this terminal right here, I've given you sort of a verse list view of the machines that are currently provisioned. You can see we've got a bootstrap node that is not running. We've got three master nodes, and we will have three worker nodes. And throughout this install, uh, I'm going to guide you through the process of deploying the cluster, first through the bootstrap process, and then we're going to add the three worker nodes to that cluster. Now, I'm using Virtual BMC, which is a tool that comes uh, out of the OpenStack world, uh, to simulate the IPMI management of these virtual bare metal machines. And these machines are going to boot uh, into iPixie, and using the MAC address of the machine as it boots, it's going to pull the appropriate uh, iPixie boot configuration file that sets its kernel parameters, sets the Fedora Core OS install, a URL and the ignition file that it's going to use to to start from. Uh, I'm using fixed IPs for this particular lab setup, so everything is already provisioned in DNS. And I'm using a, a Fedora Core OS tool called FCCT to manipulate the ignition config files to inject the IP configuration into each of the hosts. Um, I've got all of this written up uh, in, in a, um, a little tutorial that, that I've got out in my GitHub page, which we can provide a link to. 
But without further ado, we'll go ahead and fire this thing up. So the first thing I'm going to do over here in the left terminal is I'm going to power on the bootstrap node. And then I'm going to attach to its console. And what we're going to watch here, it's going to do an iPixie boot. The, it, it's a chained boot, so it first pulls um, it just a boot.ipixie file is what's being served up by the, the DHCP server for it to pull from TFTP. That then chains it to look for a file that is named after its MAC address. It pulls that file. You see it got its um, kernel and its initial RAM disk. The kernel parameters that were passed to it um, gave it its instructions for installing Fedora Core OS. And you can see right now it's actually pulling um, that FCOS image across. Now we've got an HA proxy uh, load balancer. Um, it's this guy right here, OKD4 LB01, that is already running and is um, configured to um, sit in front of this new cluster as it comes up. This will take a little bit um, with the scrolling logs. It's pull, like I said, it's pulling down the image. Um, one other thing I'll point out um, while we're waiting for the bootstrap node to, to complete its install is that we're also doing a mirrored install today, um, which hopefully makes this go a little bit faster than pulling all of the images across the wire. What I have is a local instance of a Sonotype Nexus that I have mirrored all of the images into, if you can see this eye chart. And so the install is actually going to pull its images from the Sonotype Nexus. Right now I've got Quay.io in a DNS sinkhole so that uh, it, can't, it can't resolve. And because it can't resolve, it's going to assume it's um, an air-gapped installation and it will pull from the, the configured mirror image. All right, Fedora Core OS is booting now. It's going to overlay the RPM OS tree. And when it finishes, it will boot one more time and it will start the bootstrap. which we will watch right here. Okay, so it just finished the, the OS tree overlay and now it's coming back up. When it completes booting, Should begin the bootstrap. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and fire up the master nodes. So I'm just running a little um, script here that's going to do an IPMI tool command against those three master nodes and start them up. And the fans on my little Intel Nooks just lit up hot. <laughs> okay, and in the top right corner here, um, I'm going to run the OpenShift install command and direct it to monitor the bootstrap process. And if you, uh, if you do this at home and you monitor the logs like this, don't be alarmed by these failed, failed, failed um, entries that you see coming out in the logs. This, this is the bootstrap process waiting for its resources to go live. And so it will continue to loop 
uh, until the various resources come up. And you can see the API just uh, came up. So, so our API is now live and we're waiting for the bootstrap process to complete. Down here in the bottom right hand corner, we're just um, tailing the journal control uh, logs of the bootstrap process itself. This, this all in takes about 10 minutes from the, the bootstrap node firing up to the bootstrap process itself completing. The, um, the installation itself will complete after about another 25 minutes. So we've, we've got some time now to um, take some questions if folks want. Yeah, James Cassell is asking um, from Twitch, um, is the sinkhole necessary to use Mirror? I think it still is. Um, I, I know it has been for a while that if you don't create the sinkhole and it can resolve the external um, host, it will pull the images from the from Quay.io. And that, that's why I, that's why I created the sinkhole to, to simulate a disconnected install where where I'm behind. Um, bunch of firewalls and proxies that, that prevent my nodes from having direct internet access. Let's see. A couple of questions just to double check. Um, the link to the documentation on this, is this the same as the stuff that you did in the OKD4 UPI lab setup? Yes, yes. There's a there's a new branch um, called iPixie that uh, when we're done today, um, I've got a little more cleanup on the documentation to do, but I'm going to merge that branch into master. Um, the the old um, tutorial that was the CentOS 7 based one, I've branched master to a CentOS 7 branch. So anybody that's still running CentOS 7 would want to use the CentOS 7 branch. Uh, I've upgraded my entire lab to CentOS 8 and have enabled um, iPixie even for the for the hardware for the bare metal itself. So that so that just by creating a um, an iPixie boot file with the MAC address of you know a new piece of metal, um, all I have to do is plug it into the network, click the power button, and it will provision itself with whatever personality I want it to have. I'm just checking the other feeds here. The other feeds are, are a nanosecond behind us, so um, in Blue Jing, so trying to be there. And Brian. Jacob Hepworth is saying that he really likes the Fedora Core OS news and seeing that. Kudos. So is this going to take us another 20 minutes or 30 minutes here? Uh, it, well, as soon as the bootstrap completes, then we'll be about 23 minutes out from completion. Mm -hmm. um, the bootstrap usually takes about 10 minutes in this environment. Okay, okay. I'm going to do another pitch for people to join the um, OKD working group while we are waiting here, um, because that's what I'm charged with is getting more folks in. So if you're liking what you're seeing here, or if there's features missing, um, or other platforms that we should be demoing to or testing on, um, or that you're using OKD on or wishing to do so, um, please join the OKD working group. Um, the mailing list is here. Um, I just put it in the, the chat. And um, it is in open Google group. And we have a lot of um, meetings. Every, we, we meet bi-weekly. 
Um, and we have a meeting tomorrow, and I'll throw the Fedora for OS and uh, a chef. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we will um, do the Azure one that you requested earlier. Um, that is our second to last demo, I think, today is Azure. Uh, and for the Fedora calendar link here. All right, the bootstrap is getting close. Okay, it um, bootstrap has succeeded. Now it's going to wait just a little bit longer to send the event, and then you'll see, okay, there it went. So the bootstrap is now done. Um, you can see in the middle terminal that we do have three master nodes that are live. Um, I'm going to now remove the bootstrap node. And I'm going to take it out of the HA proxy configuration as well so that we will forget everything that we know about the bootstrap node. And now we'll watch the install complete. All right, so we are working towards 4.5.0 OKD. Awesome sauce. Now, the, th this is something odd about um, this install monitor here. It will say 42% complete. Um, here in a minute, it may barf a couple of errors as um, some of the resources restart. Um, and it will also reset the clock. So it, it's, um, it, it plays with you a little bit. You'll get up to 74% complete, and then all of a sudden you'll see 12% complete, and then it will quickly wind its way back up. Um, I, I'm making a bold assumption here that that is actually the result of it monitoring some of the resources that through this process update themselves. And so that percentage of complete becomes a little bit variable. So if you, if you see that um, running this at home, don't, don't be alarmed. It, it is actually um, working towards completion and you need to be patient because from this point, it does take about another 23 minutes. Twenty-three minutes. Well, you want to talk a little bit while you're doing this about um, the work you're doing around Che. Um, sh sure. Well, actually, it wasn't. It turned out not to be much work at all. Uh, and, and in fact, if if we end up with enough time, um, I can I can deploy a um, hyperconverged Ceph instance into this cluster to give us a storage provisioner, because that that's really I think I think the folks that might have struggled with getting um, Eclipse Che up and running is that it does need persistent volumes um, both for um, Postgres. The, the, it deploys an instance of, of Postgres to support an, an instance of Keycloak that provides um, the identity provisioning identity management for your Eclipse Che environment. But the workspaces themselves also require um, persistent volumes. Uh, you can probably make it work with ephemeral volumes, just understanding that if those pods ever got evicted, um, you lose everything, which would be significantly detrimental to your um, Postgres instance. So, so it does require that you have some kind of a um, persistent storage provisioner. Um, I have done it in the past um, in older um, 3.11 clusters with iSCSI. But now with, with the Ceph operator, use, using the Rook operator to deploy Ceph, um, it's much, much easier. And something else I'll, I'll mention here, um, I'll run this again. So you, you see we've got three master nodes that are running, but they're also designated as worker nodes. Um, that's an artifact of how we're provisioning here because the install config that we used um, does not designate any worker nodes. Um, so the installer by default makes the masters schedulable. Um, when the installation is complete, that's something that, that we're going we're gonna to change. We're, we'll add the three worker nodes and then we will make the um, masters unschedulable. 
Fernando is asking, is it possible to specify a different ignition version during the DIG or GN? I'm going to say that wrong again. Dot ignition files creation. I don't think so. I believe the install. It's it's not possible. Yeah, we're stuck with one. You should at at this at this time you should always be using ignition version three point one point zero for everything. Slight correction, ignition spec version three point one point zero. I was about to say, I'm pretty sure there's more than that. The ignition versions don't match the spec version at all. Yeah, it's ignition v two point x with spec v three point x, and our current spec config spec version is three point one point zero. So for the ignition config, always use the spec version. 3.1 at this time. We should probably just bump the ignition versions just to make this a lot less confusing. Yeah. Because there's no particular reason not to, as far as I'm aware. Just going to introduce that new voice is Neil Gompa from Datto is in the house. So welcome. Hi. Back. Yes. Yeah. I just sort of forgot that I had not actually been uh, um, introduced. So I'll just. Oh yeah, I can't. Uh, why is it saying the camera isn't used by some? Whatever. Anyway, the microphone works. Figure out why the camera doesn't in a, li in a little bit. Um, uh, I'm I'm a DevOps engineer at Datto. I'm here as an OKD working group member, and I'm going to be assisting Dusty in a little bit once we once he he and I get to our part of this OKD deployment fun, uh, where I will just talk randomly uh, while while Dusty pushes buttons and stuff. Um, <laughs> Perfect. But uh, yeah. So here, I'll I'll walk you through a, a few of the things that that were prepared ahead of time. I, I said a lot of words to describe it. Um, one of the, especially the the way I'm I'm doing this with with um, fixed IP addresses. Uh, one of the things that you have to provision are DNS uh, records, a few key DNS records. Um, you can see I've got um, in here the provisioning for uh, a, several different clusters that I run. Um, but this is this is the one that we're presently looking at right here. So each of the um, master nodes, worker nodes, and the etcd nodes uh, requires an A record. Um, the, the master and the etcd obviously are sharing the same node. So, so they're going to have A records with the, with the same um, IP address. You also need um, three server records for the um, etcd. And then you need a pointer record for reverse lookup for each of the of the physical nodes. So your masters and your worker nodes, you'll need pointer records for those. But the, as you can see, the DNS setup is not onerous, um, but it is necessary. And here I'll show you what um, I'm using an OpenWRT router. Um, it's actually a travel router to um, actually provide my DHCP and IPixie capabilities. So the the boot.ipixie, as you can see, is very simple. Um, I'm echoing some information just to make sure the right host booted. Uh, and then chaining in an IPixie file that is literally named after the MAC address with hyphens replacing the colons. And here's one of them right here that I believe will be one of the worker nodes. And so this right here um, gives it the kernel parameters necessary to boot, tells it, yes, we want to install core OS, tells it where to install core OS, tells it where to get core OS, and tells it um, which ignition file to use. 
And that's really the secret sauce there. Not very secret. Yes. <laughs> you just kind of told the whole world. I did. I know. It's all right. I've already published it in my GitHub. So. <laughs> All right, we are in theory at 84% complete. Um, I expect it to reset the clock at least once while it's while it's doing this. But this is how the... do you determine this percentages? Because like I don't see anything on screen that would tell you percentages. Oh, right here. Can you see the the? Oh, the... okay. There it is. Okay. It helps when you highlighted it. There's a lot of word soup on screen. It, yes, there is. Uh, and th this is how I keep the install from being boring, is give you lots of um, journal control and logs to look at. Because <laughs> otherwise there's not a lot to look at. <laughs> no, no. So how did you come up with this setup for, I mean, you're doing the bare metal, right? So yes. how'd, you, yeah. how'd you come up with it? Oh, gosh. Because, <laughs> like, I re I remember that that bare metal is like the least fleshed out deployment method of them all. So, the fact that you came up with something is impressive all on its own. So that's worth the story, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I back in at the end of 2017, um, I got addicted to the Intel Nook um, machines, and you know, those little form factor boxes are are, are they're, they're not. They're not cheap comparatively, but considering the amount of compute that you can pack into one of them, um, for a for a home lab setup, they they are pretty affordable. Uh, and if you buy the right chipset, um, you can put 64 gigabytes of RAM in one of those little suckers. So you know you get one with a Core i7. Um, the newest ones, the the tenth generation, they've got um, six CPUs. Um, so you've got 12 um, vCPUs available and 64 gig of RAM. You, you can run quite a bit on them, and and my idea was actually get an OpenShift cluster running on the the Nux, um, and then I stumbled across this thing called nested uh, virtualization with Libvirt, and um, while I don't do OpenStack, I had a curiosity about it, and that's how I came across um, virtual BMC, and and so decided to basically bump it up a level and. Um, used libvirt virtual machines with virtual BMC to simulate uh, bare metal. And then it was just sort of, uh, I want to make this work. So I powered through making it work to get um, bare metal install of OKD uh, up and running. Um, submitted a few tickets to the Fedora Core OS team that they were very, very, very gracious to help out um, somebody that didn't know what they were doing. Um, I, I had never, you know, touched uh, core OS before, so so that was quite a bit of a learning experience. And thanks for being Dest part of the community. Uh, yeah, Dusty and those guys were they were incredibly helpful. Um, and so it's it's kind of evolved um, from from that point. The the latest iteration of it now uses the the FCCT tool to inject. Um, some customization into the machines. Um, actually, while we're while we're still waiting for that, oh, there. Hey, quick here. Here's the reset I was talking about. See how we went back to zero percent complete. Don't panic. Um, I don't know why it resets the clock like this. Maybe somebody in engineering um, could tell us, but it is still progressing. I assure you. That is very confusing and kind of frightening. Uh, actually, it looks like it resets after it downloads an update, so it probably loses all of its state when it does that. Yeah, that that that's my suspicion because it does go through several um, iterations of updating some operators. Yeah, so it's just probably losing its state every time that happens, which is unfortunate, and I'm not sure that makes sense, but it's the best I got. It still works, though. <laughs> that's what's yes. important. That's the important part. So don't freak out when it goes from 80 to 90 to zero. Yeah. So right here, if you guys can, if I don't know if this is readable, but but you can get to it on my GitHub page. So so this. Could you zoom it up just a little bit? Just. 
Zooming up one level. So there we go. Is, then it's readable. Yeah, this is a shell script um, that that I wrote that actually does the the provisioning of the of the quote unquote bare metal for me. Uh, and right right here, um, this is a YAML file that gets created where it's injecting the um, customizations that I want each of the machines to have. So in this case, um, what I'm doing is I'm creating a um, basically a rename of the primary NIC um, to NIC0 so that it doesn't come up as some funky ENP blah 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 blah. Um, I want it I want it to be more than predictable. I want it to be predictable and known. And so I'm using the MAC address of the machine to explicitly name that network interconnect device as NIC0. Uh, and that way I, I always know what it's going to be and where it's going to be. And then I inject into that its um, specific configuration. So I'm setting, you know, it's, it's name server, it's domain, it's IP address with the net mask and uh, gateway. And then I'm also injecting its host name so that it persists its host name. And there's a bunch of other stuff that the that this script does, which um, is one thing I, I am going to do. I'm going to add um, better comments into this so that if any of you are, are looking at how this thing is working, um, you'll understand what each of these sections is doing. All right, we're back up to 84% complete. At this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and fire up the worker nodes. It is safe to do so now. Actually, I could have done it a while back, but I'm going to go ahead and do it now. So I'm sending each of them an IPMI command, um, giving a 10 second pause in, in between each one just so they don't um, slam my poor little travel router with um, DHCP and file pull requests at the same time. And we'll go ahead and watch one of those guys boot up. So there's one of the workers. It's going to do the, the same thing that you guys saw the bootstrap node doing. Um, it's pulling the, the core OS image right now. And then it's going to go through the same process, uh, except that it will retrieve its ignition file. Once it, once it processes the initial ignition, overlays the, the OS tree and starts um, its process to join the cluster, it's going to get its, uh, its ignition file from the cluster that will give it the personality of a worker node. And if you watch the left-hand side of the screen um, closely, you, you should see it hit a point where it's um, waiting on, and then you'll see it very quickly pull that ignition config, and at that point, it will start to join the cluster. Oh, there it was right there, the, the start job. And there it go, it got its ignition. And so now it is booting up, and it's going to ask to be a worker node. So just to give you a quick update on the AWS cluster, it's still waiting for the cluster API to come up. Um, I do have to leave now for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, I'll be back after that, and I hope my cluster will be up by then and so see you in a little bit all right see, see you in a bit christian our cluster is up and you see awesome it gave, it gave us our initial password so let's go ahead and log in and prove to the world hopefully that this little guy is alive all right and as before um 
self-signed certs. So in whatever OS and browser you're using, you are going to have to accept those certs. It's okay. Self-signed certs are fine. All right. Now, it creates a um, temporary cluster administrator for you, and that it dumps that password at the end of the install process that you can use to um, gain access to your cluster. And there we are. Now, there will still be some operator updating things going on and your control plane um, will still be settling out. Um, but at this point, we have a live cluster. Ooh. If you will indulge me for a few minutes, um, we'll go ahead and finish adding the worker nodes. And then we'll do a couple of housekeeping things on our cluster. So you see we've got some pending um, certificate signing request. Um, that is also an artifact of the way we're doing this um, user provision infrastructure install is that it's not automatically going to approve those certs because it doesn't necessarily trust anybody that wants to join the cluster. So I'm going to approve those certs. And there should be another batch of three that are going to come up pending. Um, yep. And so now we have three worker nodes. They're not ready yet. They're still completing their own personal bootstrap. And that'll take a, another minute or two for them to come live. And I'm going to do a couple of house clean, cleaning things here. One is um, I'm going to remove the samples operator uh, because it, um, unless something has changed recently, and unfortunately Christian isn't um, here we can ask him later. Um, the samples operator, because you don't have an official Red Hat secret at this point, um, it won't be fully functional and can, in fact, impede um, updates to your cluster. So I yank it out, um, not using it anyway, at least at this point. Uh, I'm also going to create a ephemeral storage uh, for the uh, image registry because it will also be in a removed state because it doesn't have a persistent volume. So I'm um, patching its configuration with an empty dir specification for a persistent volume. And I'm going to create an image pruner to run at midnight every night because the, the console will gripe at you um, if you don't have an image pruner configured until you do. So anything older than 60 minutes, it's going to prune at midnight every night, or 60 days, rather. 60 minutes would be um, 60 aggressive. Minutes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, you, I, I don't know what kind of storage you have, but 60 minutes might be appropriate if you basically only have enough for the cluster itself to run. And there we are. We have... Yay! Cluster. Okay, now, huge caveat. Ooh, ooh. Our, our masters are still schedulable. Our workers are schedulable. But that's not bad. Well, it's not, but there is a gotcha in here, which, of course, I never tripped over. Um, your ingress pods will deploy on... A schedulable node. Well, if um, your load balancer is only configured to look at certain nodes, um, here you see I've got my um, the port 80 and port 443 and port 6443. They're all directed to the master nodes. Well, if those ingress pods got evicted and rescheduled themselves on a, a node that is not in your load balancer configuration, then you will lose 
access to your cluster. Important safety tip. So, so the key the key here is either to span your load balancer, which I don't really want to do because that's a lot of extra cruft in the the load balancer configuration, or designate some infrastructure nodes. And that's the path that that I chose to take. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to designate my master nodes to also be infrastructure nodes. What Why doesn't it do that by default? Um, well, be, because the, 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 the best practice is to create a couple of worker nodes that you set aside as infrastructure nodes. Why? I don't know. Good. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Because, like, I've seen these recommendations listed in the documentation, but there doesn't seem to be any particular reasoning to back them up. Like historically speaking, I've seen clusters typically do the masters as infra nodes because that way they handle essentially the stuff that keeps the cluster itself running and the worker nodes are free to uh, work on um, developer or user workloads. Yeah, I think one of the things you need to consider is how how beefy uh, you make your master nodes. You know, if you've got heavy, heavy, heavy ingress operations, um, you know, given everything else that the master nodes are doing, um, that that might be a little overwhelming for them. In, in my particular lab environment, um, the, the the master nodes are heavyweight enough. E each of them has 30 gig of RAM and um, six vCPUs. So so I feel pretty confident um, designating them as infra nodes. So what you do once you once you run this label on them, then you need to patch the scheduler so that the master nodes are no longer schedulable. You'll see right now they are infra, master, and worker nodes. When I run this, now they're just infra and master nodes. Now at this point, nothing got evicted off of them. So if you wanna boot things off of them that you don't want running on there anymore, um, you, you do need to either go through and evict all the pods that are running on each of those nodes manually or reboot your master nodes, uh, which is a bit more of an aggressive way of doing it. Now I'm gonna patch the ingress operator to tell it that it's okay for it to run on those master nodes. And if you can read the I chart here, I'll, I'll explain what it's doing. It's setting a node placement policy, um, giving it a match label of infra node it's also that's not enough you also have to set some tolerations because the master node is now tainted um, so so you need to give it a toleration that it's okay for it to run with a node that has a taint of no schedule and a taint of master node and so now that that is done you will see the ingress operator Uh, one of them is terminating. There's a new one running that is not in a ready state yet. As soon as this one is in a running state, the second one will begin terminating. Don't panic that your other one sits in a pending state for a while because it has an anti-affinity rule that it won't run on a node that already has an ingress pod running on it. So it has to wait for one of those terminating pods to complete terminating before it will schedule on the master node. Wow. And so there you go. Now we've got one running, we've got one pending, and we've got two terminating. And it, it will remain in that state until one of the terminating pods completes terminating, and then the anti-affinity rule can be satisfied, and the, the pending pod will also deploy. And, and these take a while to terminate because they're shedding load. They're, they're, they're gracefully shutting down. Okay, there you go. So one of them is done terminating. We now have two running uh, ingress pods. Um, one of them is in a ready state. One of them is still bootstrapping. And the last thing I'm going to do 
is get rid of that Qubit Admin account because its password is sitting there in plain text in your installation folder. So I'm oh, so it does get written down to this somewhere. I was going to I was going to ask, are you just do you have to make sure you you save that output text or will it actually be somewhere where you can get to it? Yeah, if you if you look at the the directory that you used for the installation. So there's um you know there's the boot the the ignition files that it um created and the metadata. It creates an auth directory. Um, and in that auth directory, it creates an initial qubit config, which you can load to give you access um, to your cluster directly from your command line, and it um, dumps that plain text password right there. But if you so get rid of the kubeadmin user, doesn't everything that like links to the kubeadmin user break? It's a temporary account. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I, I created an HT password file uh, ahead of time. My tutorial um, has instructions for how to do that. Um, so, so I've got an admin user and a dev user with passwords already in there. Um, you saw me just create a secret right here. So I apply, I created a secret in the OpenShift config namespace. Um, called HT password secret from that file. And now I'm going to um, apply a custom resource. That I've already here, let me. Um, So this is the custom resource that we're going to apply. Um, it's setting up an HT password identity provider, and it's going to link it um, to that secret um, that we just created, the HT password secret. So I will apply that. Uh, it complains that I used apply instead of create, but uh, I'm just in a habit of using apply um, to update objects so you can ignore that that complaint there and then the last thing i need to do is this admin user that i i just set up a secret for but doesn't exist i'm going to give him cluster admin rights and now i'm going to be brave and i'm going to delete well it also says the admin user doesn't exist Th that's correct um but it creates it in the background what yeah it's not intuitive no or obvious but it does and it works okay and so there we go i just logged in with my new somewhat more secure cluster admin account and you can see our four green check boxes we've got a happy cluster um, it will complain about alerts until you like set up a slack channel or something to send your alerts to um it's actually pretty easy to do you create a receiver and walk through it um but i have used up most of my allotted time so i'll stop playing now and see if i think the playing is fine <laughs> yeah. no i'm gonna give you that that was easy button <laughs> all right well played and um can you do one more thing for me, just because um, I think people keep asking me these questions. Go back to the console and show uh, the operators that are installed in your installation. Sure, I will do that. All right, so you go to operators, operator hub. Um, are there no operators found? Because operators don't exist. They install those. I think no, it, you know, it may still be it may still be updating. Oh. Um, well, the operator hub operator might not actually be up yet. Yeah, because it does it does take a while after you know that that initial install took us another 23 minutes. It does take things uh, a while to settle down. Um, 
let me let me show you what it does look like because I have another cluster that I um, stood up this morning. Um, it seems less healthy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I, I I think I did something to upset it. Uh, but here's the here are the operators that are available. Quite a few. You can see there's if you want code ready workspaces, the the upstream of it. Um, Eclipse Che is in here. Do you have enough time to try and install the Eclipse Che one? Um, I might, especially if you don't mind going a couple minutes over, because the first thing I need to do is um, deploy. Oh, actually, no, I can, because I've already got, let, let me make sure I've got um, Steph deployed in this cluster. Uh, so we're going to go to the Rook Ceph namespace. Yes. Yes, we cool. do. The yes. fact that the Rook Steph namespace kind of indicates you have it set up. Well, it doesn't, not it doesn't. It shouldn't exist if you don't have it. No, it, it, it can exist, and I haven't completed the install yet. But well, okay, well. there's that. All right. So we'll go back to the operator hub, and we'll find the Eclipse Che operator. And yeah, it's a community operator. If I call Red Hat, they're not going to help me with it. Um, but if I go on the Slack channel, they're usually nice enough. Okay. And unless you want to do something different about it, you install. And we're going to keep the stable. Um, it is going to uh, create the Eclipse Che namespace. And we're going to let it have an automatic strategy for um, its approval. If you switch that to manual, then when the installer installs, you, you have to go to the installer and then say, yes, you can actually install. That seems painful. Well, if you think about it, you know, I'm doing everything as a cluster administrator. Um, so if you're not a cluster administrator, but you, you know, you want to request something, um, that's part of what what we've got going on here, because there's all kinds of configurable RBAC um, capabilities within this thing. So when you install this operator as an as a cluster admin, does that mean that anybody who logs in with an account can then instantiate it afterwards? A absolutely, yes, a absolutely. The workspaces people will be able to get in and create um, workspaces. Again, um, you know, it, it's got lots of role role based. Uh, access control so that so that you can control who can do what uh, but yes anybody that you've got um, created an account in in this cluster should be able to log into Che uh, create an account in Che which will uh, provision them into the key cloak instance that it's going to create and then they can create a workspace so let me switch this real quick to the workloads Okay, our operator is running, it is alive, so we should be able to provision a Che cluster. And you see what I did from the, from the operator, here's the installed operators, the provided APIs, um, that's what I clicked on to get to this view here, that I can now create a Che cluster. Um, it's going to name it Eclipse Che, unless I tell it to do something else. Lots of things you can configure in here. I'm going to take the defaults on everything uh, except storage. And this is what I was mentioning earlier that I believe um, has probably hung some people up is um, Postgres is going to need a, a PVC. And then any workspace that you provision is also going to need a PVC which almost requires that you have a dynamic storage provisioner for this to work. So I am going to give it the name of the storage class. And actually, I'm going to cancel out of this, go down here to storage, show you that we do, in fact, have a storage class. It's a block provisioner as part of Ceph. And when we create our cluster, I'm going to tell it to use that for Postgres. And I'm going to tell it to use that for 
the uh, workspaces. Uh, also note, each workspace is going to get a gigabyte of provision storage. That may or may not be enough, depending on the type of development that you're doing. Um, that's pretty minimal. So you, you might want to crank that up to five or 10 gigabytes, depending on you know how how big the artifacts that are going to be built and the code base and you know everything about the development environments that, that you're going to be working with. So I'll create create on that, switch back to the pod view. And you can see it's provisioning um, Postgres. Hopefully our storage provisioner is working. And we do in fact have a Postgres data that is bound. So our storage provisioner is working. Okay, Postgres is running, not ready, so it's still it's still deploying itself. And this will take this takes a couple of minutes, and then Keycloak is going to provision itself um, after Postgres is done. So now Keycloak is provisioning, and Keycloak actually goes through a couple of phases. It it has an, an init phase. Um, that it that it runs through. So you'll see that pod come up and then terminate and and be replaced by another key cloak pod that will be your your final configuration. And you won't see the the Che controller um, come up until both Postgres and Key Cloak have completed their provisioning. And about how long does that take? Diane has to ask. Um, it, not terribly long, a um, couple of minutes. Okay, cool. It feels like a long time when you're staring at the screen. That's all right. I have plenty of coffee today. And um, Michael has just pointed out um, maybe there, you still have Quay.io blocked via DNS. And that uh, I, oh, you know what? I. I I don't. That was a good point out. I snuck that in while Neil was talking. Um, I right here. I blasted a command to my um, DNS server to remove the sinkholes for um, Quay.io and for um, registry.service.ci.openshift.org. I did actually notice, which is why I didn't repeat the question that he was saying because. Uh, I figured on screen it was obvious that you got rid of your Quay IO block. No, I, I slipped that in and, and didn't mention it. So well, good now it. All right, so we've got um, Key Cloak is is bootstrapping itself now. Uh, so you'll see you'll see some activity go there. All right, and there it is. So now you see another Key Cloak instance um, provisioning. And it will take over from the, the first one here in a minute. As we all wait with bated breath. In other news, uh, Christian says that his full-blown AWS cluster has finished installation. So when we're done, we'll pop over and let him prove that, and then right. we'll, we'll we'll grab Dusty when he's back, and we'll hit up the DigitalOcean stuff. Okay, the cloak is running. Any of you who are joining us for the DigitalOcean um, demo will probably get started on that one a few minutes after the hour. Um, we're running pretty close to on time, which I think is amazing. Indeed. And we'll we'll probably lose that thread at some point, but hey. And quick plug for my favorite Java framework. Quarkus. There we go. There's the Quarkus ad. Thank you. And 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 what does that have to do with this? Well, once your cluster is up and running, you got to run something in it, right? <laughs> oh, so you're going to make something with Quarkus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Built so, that so, mad programming skills. Yes, indeed. 
So, so the the first key cloak instance, you see it terminating now, so it's getting itself out of the way. The plugin registry is fired up. Now you see other activity. There's our Che um, controller right here that is creating. We've got a dev file registry. We've got a plugin registry. And as soon as this guy becomes ready, I wish you could hear the fans on my little nooks. I wish I had a fan here. The temperature is popping up here in uh, Canada on the West Coast. It's probably going to hit 32 today. So. Uh, all right. So all of the resources are up. They are all in a ready state. We've had no restarts, which is always a good sign, um, although occasionally a restart is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if we click over here to the routes, um, we have a route for Che, and if I'm brave and open that, okay. Now, self-signed cert again. So, what you have to do at this point is grab that cert. Uh, I'm going to create a, a folder here um, for you guys so you don't have to see all the cruft on my screen. Uh, I'm going to go here. I'm going to show the certificate. This is Safari specific, uh, obviously. Um, so follow the instructions for your favorite browser. Safari is not my favorite, but here it is. Um, grab that, um, and then what you're going to do is once you've got that certificate, you need to add it to the trust store of your operating system. So in my case, I'm going to go into Keychain, and I'm going to drop that certificate into Keychain, and I'm going to make it trusted. I'm going to do that for you guys here real quick. I'm going to uh, drop it into my certs, system default certs. You see there's there's an old one from a previous install. Uh, I'm going to take the one that we just downloaded, and I'm going to replace. Okay. Now I'm going to open this up. And I'm going to say, always trust. Now it's going to make me um, certify that I am me one more time. Now, ta-da! And I'm going to say, yet yeah, allow these permissions. And now it's going to um, it's going to ask you to create an account. Now, another important safety tip: if you do what I did, there is an admin account that Che creates. Well, I named my cluster administrator admin, so I need to give this um, a different name, or I will cause some pain for myself. And there we go. Clips Che up, running, ready for your code. Woo! Awesome. That is awesome sauce. Thank you very much for that. That that makes my day. This is awesome. Yay! Thank you. Yeah, I think you've just made the entire Eclipse Che community happy too. So well done. <laughs>